All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. It's a nice crowd. Kristen, you're very popular. This is probably our, one of our more popular to date um, Zoom meetings. And uh, I will just not waste my time, your time, but I'll introduce Kristen. Um, it's Dr. Pearlstein. Uh, she's the Anatomical Collections Manager at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland, whose mission is to preserve and explore the impact of military medicine. And today's presentation will focus on Civil War medicine in particular. So thank you so much, Kristen, for being here, and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you for having me, everyone. We'll just jump right into the slides. Um, and hopefully this all goes smoothly. I'm a little bit nervous, so uh, be patient with me. OK. Even bigger, yes. OK. Um, so I'm Kristen. Um, as Carolyn said, I'm the anatomical manager um, for the collections at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I've been working with museum collections for about 15 years, and my background is in anthropology. I have a PhD in physical anthropology. Um, a quick introduction to the museum, if you've never been before. We were established as the Army Medical Museum in 1862, and I'll talk a little bit about the purpose later, but we were established um, as a reaction to the Civil War. So that's part of why um, my museum is connected to the Civil War. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the challenges and advances in military medicine during the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. So the Civil War starts on April 12th, 1861, when Confederate forces fired on Union forces at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. And we're gonna fast forward um, a few months to the first major battle of the war, which is fought at Bull Run, Manassas, Virginia, Manassas, on Virginia. July 21st, 1861. And the medical response to this battle and really the first year of battles is a total disaster for several reasons. For starters, there's a complete lack of organization and unification in the medical corps. There's no system in place for medical evacuation from the field. Civilian ambulance drivers actually fled the battle and left wounded men on the field for days, several of which uh, it was raining. And also medical supplies were not ordered until the battle was over. The next issue at the time was that when men were finally removed from the field, they were receiving irregular and inadequate treatments. Many military surgeons lacked training and experience with combat medicine at the time. Medical school was only for two years, and it was mostly lectures, um, not clinical experience. And the most recent major military conflict had been the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848, which some older surgeons had been part of, but many of the younger surgeons had not. And also many of the older surgeons had spent a number of the last years working at army outposts in the Western territories where they'd been cut off from new publications and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So they were sort of behind uh, the times in clinical practices. So going into the war, most surgeons had never treated a single gunshot wound, let alone hundreds of horrific gunshot wounds and artillery injuries in one day. Another problem was there were no large established military hospitals that could sleep and treat hundreds of wounded soldiers. The military had been using infirmaries at army outposts, so essentially small clinics, and the largest military hospital was in Kansas and only had 40 beds. The largest military hospital in DC consisted of six rooms devoted to smallpox patients and civilian, at the hos civilian hospitals at the time were primarily used for poor who were sick and many were still attached to almshouses, so not really set up for combat care. And you can see these early pictures um, of hospital scenes in 1861. They're just kneeling in tents doing surgery, you know, kneeling in the dirt. Another factor was the changing weapon technology. Previous wars had utilized the round musket ball, which was slower and tended to lodge in the soft tissue. That's this middle ball here in this image. But during the Civil War, both armies, both the North and the South, adopted the mini ball, this conoidal ball here on the left, which spun faster and struck harder and shattered bones along the way like this femur here on the right. So this is your um, upper thigh bone. It's the largest bone of your body. 
and you can see where the bullet has just torn right through the middle of that bone. And then one of the biggest challenges during the Civil War were problems with sanitation and sterilization. The war was before the universal understanding and acceptance of bacteriology and antiseptics, so there was a limited understanding and limited resources to prevent or eliminate things that cause infection and disease, like no antibiotics, no neosporin, the types of things that we take for granted today to uh, clean our wounds. Uh, you also had surgeons operating with dirty hands, unsterile bloody instruments, and sometimes used rags and bandages. And then you also had crowded camps, open latrines, often near water sources, um, so the drinking water, decomposing food, unclean water because it was near the latrines, and inadequate hygiene and nutrition. Um, and it wouldn't be until 1867, after the war, that Joseph Lister first starts to publish on antiseptic techniques for cleaning wounds, and germ theory wouldn't be established until the 1870s, so they really didn't know, you know how to address bacteria at all, because they didn't know that it existed. So the first few battles of the Civil War are a wake-up call to the U.S. Medical Department. They've gone badly, um, everything's disorganized, they're having trouble treating the men. Um, but over the course of the next few years, they start to get organized and they learn to adapt to the problems that they can address. And we see a number of innovations put into place that permanently alter and improve the course of military medicine. And as a side note for the slides going forward, most of the records that we have are from the Union side. We know fewer statistics from the Confederate Medical Corps because most of those records were burned in a fire in Richmond in 1865. So in 1862, William Hammond is appointed as the Surgeon General of the United States Army, and another surgeon named Jonathan Letterman is appointed as the Medical Director of the Army of the Potomac, which is the main Union Army. And both of these men are efficient and organized, and they're ready to make some improvements. And one of the main issues they tackle is getting men off the field and into treatment, so no one is just lying out in the woods for days. And by August of 1862, Letterman has set up a military ambulance corps and an organized system of medical care. And this is just in time for the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, which was the bloodiest single day in American history with 23,000 men dead or wounded. And you can imagine how much worse it would be if there wasn't an organized system of medical care already in place. So we can safely say that Letterman revolutionized combat trauma care. So the system that he and Hammond set up is that ambulance corps stretcher bearers would take wounded soldiers from the field to triage centers behind the front lines. And at these triage centers, surgeons would sort and treat based on the severity of injuries, so walking wounded versus not going to make it. And then ambulances would transport injured soldiers to nearby field hospitals, which would be tents, barns, houses, or other buildings. Um, as a local example, the main building of Tandem Friends School was used as a Confederate Civil War hospital, um, field hospital, and is actually still haunted by a Confederate soldier that walks up and down upstairs. And so by the Battle of Gettysburg in 1864, um, all the wounded soldiers on both sides were removed from the field and taken to field hospitals each night. Necessary surgeries were decided on and performed within 48 hours of wounding, and the whole system was just more efficient on both sides at saving lives. And these pictures show examples of the early ambulances, um, which you can see are essentially just covered wagons. And you can imagine without paved roads that you would be bumping along and it would be pretty uncomfortable, um, but still better than being left out in the field for days. From field hospitals, soldiers were transported by train or boat to a growing number of large general hospitals. The trains and boats were outfitted for medical care to keep treating soldiers along their journey. For example, the DA January, which is this model here, um, had a surgical suite, baths, kitchen, nurses' quarters, and hot and cold running water, and nearly 450 beds, and over the course of four years, treated 23,000 wounded men as it was transporting them. Um, and general hospitals that were being built, this is an example on this side, of Lincoln General Hospital built in 1862 in DC. Um, general hospitals that were being built were in a pavilion style with a number of wards that fanned out from the center and were built with a lot of ventilating windows. This made hospitals drafty and cold 
but it followed the recommendations of Florence Nightingale, who had observed during the Crimean War in Europe a decade earlier that ventilation helped combat disease. Um, so they were trying to model off of, off of what she had learned. Also, a number of specialty hospitals were being built, such as Turner's Lane Hospital in Philadelphia, which was dedicated to the care and study of soldiers with neurological disorders. Um, so nerves and nerve trauma and, um, and disease. By 1865, over, there were over 400 general hospitals, uh, but only about 200 were in use at any given time. They would build them and then kind of, as the war, as the battles moved on, they would uh, abandon them. And then by the end of the war, more than 1 million soldiers had received care in a federal military hospital, which is a pretty big number. Also during this time, uh, medical skill evaluations for the doctors were standardized and the more experienced surgeons were moved into leadership positions to make more efficient use of their knowledge. Um, so doing a better job of kind of weeding out the bad doctors um, and giving more, um, more power to the, uh, the experienced doctors. Um, this was also a time where the United States Army embraced the um, safe use of anesthesia. Anesthesia had actually been introduced to the American military in the late 1840s, around the time of the Mexican-American War, but it got off to kind of a slow start. Um, but during the Civil War, it was consistently used by both the North and the South for all surgical operations. And when we think about the Civil War, there's kind of this common misconception that Operations occurred with just like a swig of whiskey and biting down on a chunk of wood, um, but those instances were actually very rare. Um, and some of them come from eyewitness accounts of soldiers being held down and moaning and kind of thrashing around during the surgery, which made it seem like anesthesia was not used. Um, but in fact, usually they would use just enough anesthesia to make someone insensitive to pain and kind of out of it, but not enough to put someone completely to sleep. So there was still a state of muscle tension and agitation during surgery, um, and that's what the eyewitnesses were seeing. It wasn't that the person uh, was actually not feeling the pain. Um, in fact, they had been given anesthesia and were not feeling the pain. So the, the two types of anesthesia that were being used uh, were primarily chloroform and ether. Chloroform was mostly administered in the field, and ether was mostly administered in hospitals. And this picture here on the right um, is a staged example of how a surgeon would administer anesthesia to a patient. Um, so a, a training picture from the Civil War. Also in 1862 is the establishment of the Army Medical Museum, now the National Museum of Health and Medicine, or my museum. Um, it was actually established on May 21st, 1862. So today is the museum's 158th birthday, which is pretty exciting for us. And the purpose of the museum was to collect medical reports, documents, artifacts, and anatomical specimens pertaining to death or disability during the war in order to understand and improve health outcomes for soldiers. So they really wanted to collect all this information and figure out what lessons could be learned. Um, this material and the accompanying case reports uh, were used to compile the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more on a later slide. But basically all the statistics that we have about how many surgeries took place, which surgeries took place, and what worked and what didn't work come from the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. So this was a huge undertaking by the museum to collect the lessons learned and advance the field of military medicine. By 1866, surgeons had contributed 4,719 surgical specimens to the museum, almost exclusively from the Civil War. And as part of the overall documentation of military medicine, the museum was also taking photographs. Um, so here on the slide, we have an example of a lower limb specimen and uh, so this is the, the lower, um, your tibia, your fibula, and your, your foot bones there, um, amputated above the ankle here. You can see the fracturing that happened um, from the injury. So this is a lower limb specimen and the accompanying medical report of this individual from the Battle of Cedar Mountain, 
And then here we have a photograph that the museum took after the war documenting army officers with healed amputations. So these are the, the types of records, specimens, and photographs that the museum holds. Um, some of the staggering statistics from the Civil War is that um, twice as many soldiers died of disease than died of combat injuries. Of the approximately 600,000 total deaths, which includes both the North and the South, and that's actually a, a low estimate. We think there were probably, you know, closer to 700, uh, maybe 750,000. Um, but of the, the sort of known recorded six, 600,000 total deaths, about 400,000 individuals died by disease. And just on the Union side, you can see how the numbers break down to about 63% disease, 12% um, wounds, so infections, um, and then 19% actually killed in action on the battlefield. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the more common camp diseases first, and then we'll talk a little bit about surgery and infection. So when I say camp diseases, I'm talking about the types of disease that typically circulate in overcrowded conditions with bad hygiene, poor nutrition, overexhaustion, and bad sanitary measures. The four most common camp diseases were dysentery, typhoid, pneumonia, and malaria. The most common cause of death was dysentery, which is an acute bacterial um, or an acute intestinal infection that causes severe diarrhea, dehydration, fever, cramps and bloody bowel movements. And it's caused by ingesting food or water that's been contaminated with bacteria or parasites, um, which is why having the open latrines by the water sources where they're like filling up with their canteens um, and having the decomposing food with circulating flies and having a time period where you're not washing your hands um, was such a major problem. Um, more than 60,000 soldiers in both the North and the South had a recorded cause of death as diarrhea or dysentery, which you can just imagine that many people with diarrhea is not exactly like a comfortable living situation. The second most common cause of death from disease was typhoid. Typhoid is a contagious bacterial infection, meaning it can spread from person to person or from person through contaminated food and water to another person. And you've all probably heard of typhoid Mary, who was a cook in the late 1800s that inadvertently spread typhoid to a bunch of different families because she was an asymptomatic carrier of the salmonella bacteria and was shedding that bacteria in all the households. Um, so we've all kind of heard of, of typhoid before. Um, during the Civil War, about 27,000 men died out of 75,000 cases of typhoid, and that's just in the Union Army. And the Army Medical Museum received a number of intestine specimens like this one on the left. This is actually one from our museum. Um, so that surgeons could study how the disease caused ulcerations of the intestines and get a better understanding of the, um, of the effect of typhoid on the human body. Um, another common camp disease was malaria, which was a particular problem in the South uh, where there were more marshy areas and therefore more mosquitoes. Like DC is often called a malarial swamp, even though we don't think of it as being a swamp anymore. Um, malaria caused fevers, chills, and anemia in reoccurring episodes. So a soldier could be incapacitated and recover and be incapacitated again. And it ultimately caused about 1 million cases and 12,000 deaths in just the Union Army. And then bacteria, the sort of fourth most common um, camp disease was um, contagious bacterial infection that primarily affected the lungs, particularly in soldiers with compromised immune systems from exposure to the elements, lack of nutrition and crowded camp conditions. And then other diseases um, that they dealt with were typhus, tetanus, flu, measles, chickenpox, smallpox, um, although smallpox was mostly controlled with vaccination and isolation, so that wasn't a, a huge problem at the time. So you remember that the mini ball that I showed you guys in an earlier slide, that new bullet technology was just ripping up limbs and smashing through bones, and you can see some of those bones here um, on, on the slide. You can see where 
you know, the fractures are, are fairly large um, and complete. Um, untreated fractures often resulted in really serious infections because of embedded bullet fragments, soil, clothing fibers, et cetera, that had contaminated the wound. And also the bones were in pieces, so it was hard to find all the little fragments that were floating around in a wound. Um, so amputation allowed for the most control over an injury and gave surgeons a clean slate to work with. And it's estimated that about 60,000 men in both the North and the South lost limbs to amputation, and about 45,000 survived the operation. So the overall survival rate for amputation was about 75%, but that decreased the closer to the trunk the amputation was where the main arteries were involved. So for example, upper and mid thigh amputations had about a 50-50 chance of survival. And we think of amputations as primarily involving the loss of an arm or a leg, but actually about 30% of Union Army amputations were for hands, feet, fingers, and toes. Whoops. Um, for example, this guy down here in the, the lower right-hand corner um, is missing his fingers due to amputation. Um, in addition to amputations, another type of surgery Civil War surgeons were utilizing for limb injuries were excisions. Uh, at the time, they called them either excisions or exceptions. Um, now we would call it a resection in modern clinical settings. And it's basically the partial removal of a bone or joint. So in this case, this is your humerus, your upper arm bone. Um, and they've just removed the sort of top part, the, the ball part of the ball and socket of the shoulder. To perform an excision, surgeons used a tool called a chainsaw, which is this thin, ropey-looking saw here in this picture. Um, and it was basically like a skinny bike chain. And the chainsaw, as opposed to a, a flat saw, could sort of more nimbly reach the bone while leaving muscles and muscle attachments in place. So they were able to, to remove parts of bone without having to hack off the whole limb. Uh, there are a wide range of recorded results from excision that had surgeons debating the merits for a number of years. Some individuals could barely lift their arms to feed themselves, while others could write and play the banjo and lift their kids and other sorts of things. So this slide kind of shows an example of that range. On the left, you have Private Cleghorn, who had his entire upper arm and his elbow uh, joint removed. Um, and with his arms supported in the sling apparatus, he was still able to lift and carry things, but pension examiners declared his arm worse than useless, and the better it was amputated, you know, the faster, or the faster it was amputated, the better. Um, but he enjoyed having his hand to lift and carry things. And then here on the right, you have John Reardon. This is John Reardon's bone, so this is the, the upper one third of the humerus. Um, and pension examiners declared John Reardon useless for manual labor, but he got a job at the Army Medical Museum and was able to lift a weight of 200 pounds, so not at all useless. Another type of surgery performed during the Civil War was trepanation, which is a type of cranial surgery designed to relieve pressure on the brain from swelling or bleeding. Um, trepanation has actually been used for at least 7,000 years, but during the Civil War, the surgery was used performing a small um, round corkscrew-like saw, so this, this type of blade here, that could drill in and remove a circular plug of bone. So these sort of perfect circles that you're seeing um, in these two bone specimens are from the trepanation. And the success rate was not good during the Civil War. It was fatal in about one half of the 220 operations performed by Union surgeons. A new type of surgery um, that surgeons successfully introduced and advanced were, was facial reconstruction. This example shown here is Private Roland Ward. He was struck in 1864 by an artillery fragment that destroyed his jaw, the floor of his mouth, and part of his neck, which you can see in this first photograph here. And over the course of the next year, military surgeons performed a number of operations to reconstruct the floor of his mouth, so these two photos, um, so he could eat and drink sitting up and could control his saliva. And all of these photos track his healing over the course of 12 years, and this last one is in 1877, 
And you can see, you can barely even tell that he is missing his jaw. Um, so that was a pretty innovative surgery. And, um, and there are several other cases like Private Rollins. Once any bleeding or hemorrhaging was controlled in an injury, the largest obstacle to surviving a battlefield injury or keeping an injured limb was infection. Because surgeons were not working in a sterile, germ-free environment, infection was pretty rampant. And surgeons understood at this time that unclean wounds were more likely to develop infections, so they tried to remove bullets, dirt, embedded materials, and damaged tissue. But with the resources of the time, they just were not able to completely clean wounds. And that's why amputation was often the best method of controlling an injury. Infections were primarily caused by the Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes bacteria. And when these bacteria were introduced to open wounds, they could cause either erysipelas, uh, which is a bacterial infection of the skin layers, and that's what you're seeing here where they've colored in um, this ulceration, or pyemia, which is a septic infection of the blood. So we would call it sepsis probably today. Um, sometimes they called it blood poisoning. And bacterial infections were also introduced to the bones through open wounds um, and would develop into osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection um, that results in a combination of bone tissue death, bone tissue, um, irregular bone formation, and nasty pus producing abscesses that drain from the inside out like uh, sap working its way out of a tree. So that's what these holes are here. Um, this photo is an example of a tibia and a fibula, so your lower leg bones, which developed osteomyelitis after an amputation of the foot. The foot would have been here. Um, and, and these holes, these cloaca, are where the pus is draining out. Kind of nasty. An interesting case of osteomyelitis from the museum is the hip bone of Brigadier General Henry Barnum, um, seen up here. Um, Barnum was a major at the time of his injury and was shot through the hip and left for dead, then captured by Confederate forces and traded back to the Union. And he returned to duty, but the injury never really healed. It kept forming abscesses of pus and they would drain, and then it would form an abscess and they would drain it again. And eventually a doctor just inserted an oiled piece of rope through the entire wound, front to back, to keep the tract open for drainage. And a few years later, the rope was replaced by a rubber tube, which Barnum wore for 30 years. And you can see in this picture here um, that he has the tube through his hip that he's holding. And we recently did a CT scan of the bone and it revealed that Barnum's hip still had bullet fragments embedded in the wound. So this purple picture is the CT scan and all these little white dots, um, those are the bullet fragments that are still embedded in the bone and those bullet fragments would be carrying bacteria. And so that's what was contributing to the decades long case of infection. Another common, common type of infection was gangrene, which is soft tissue death from a bacterial infection. Gangrene could spread quickly through the body and start shutting down major organs, and about 45% of soldiers who contracted gangrene died. Gangrene would often develop in projectile or explosive traumatic injuries when bacteria was introduced into the wound with embedded soil or clothing particles. So the bullet goes in and it's carrying parts of the uniform and the dirt that's on the uniform with it. And depending on the type of bacteria, bacteria, it developed into gas gangrene, which is not a result of poison gas, which I thought for a number of years, because you hear it mentioned a lot in conjunction with World War I, World War II. Um, but it's actually the bacteria is producing toxins that release gas, and that's why it's called gas gangrene. The other type of gangrene, other than gas gangrene, was called hospital gangrene during the Civil War, and was usually caused by a streptococcal infection possibly in combination with another bacterial agent and was primarily observed only in the large permanent hospitals. And hospital gangrene could spread really quickly between people and surgeons and nurses noticed the connection between gangrene and erysipelas. So they would try to isolate those patients to control the spread um, and that actually worked pretty well. And surgeons also used a chemical called bromine to disinfect gangrenous wounds and that tended to work um, but the supplies could be limited and the pain was excruciating. So they had to anesthetize people before they gave them the bromine. After the war, back on the, the innovation front, um, large numbers of amputees, you remember there were 45,000 amputees 
um, inspired advancements in rehabilitation and the use of prosthetic devices, so artificial limbs. The US government promised a prosthetic limb to any Union soldier who wanted one and authorized the purchase of 6,000 devices. Several Southern states had similar programs for their Confederate soldiers. Um, but many Civil War veterans found that the artificial limbs already on the market were not adequate for their purposes. They were not comfortable. Um, they were not easy to use. And so they took it upon themselves to develop a better project. And one example here is um, here on the right is Private Samuel Decker, um, a double arm amputee who developed his own artificial limbs that allowed him to write and pick up and carry objects. And he worked as a bouncer for the House of Representatives. You can see um, the, the artificial limbs that he designed himself were in his picture with him. One of the leading prosthetic limb companies that's still operating today was started by a Confederate amputee called James Edward Hanger, and I think the, the company is Hanger Inc. And the relationship between the US government and support and research into better artificial limbs for US soldiers has continued since the Civil War. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the reports, histories, and specimens that surgeons were sending to the Army Medical Museum became the multi-volume surgical and history of the War of the Rebellion. Um, the last volume was published in 1883, and Mishwar represents, Mishwar is what we call it for short, um, but it represents one of the most extensive data collection efforts in the history of wartime medicine, uh, which took almost 20 years to organize and compile the data and reports on the surgical successes and failures informed later medical practices and decisions. So Mishwar is kind of seen as one of the most important bodies of work um, to advance combat medicine. So in summary, here are some of the, the challenges and advances um, that I ran through today. Um, one more advancement that I want to mention was that during the Civil War, the US Army hired the first female acting assistant surgeon named Mary Walker. Um, who was pretty cool, and you can see she's wearing pants in this picture, which was not common for women at the time, but she just bucked the convention and did her own thing. Um, this is her surgical kit, a uh, picture of it here on the right. Um, and also the Civil War was a time where um, nursing was advanced as an organized profession in the United States under the management of Superintendent of Nurses, Dora, Dorothea Dix, we've all probably heard of, um, who had studied the work of British nurse Florence Nightingale. So that is my very brief uh, run through of uh, chances and advances in military medicine. Um, the museum is currently closed in the time of COVID, but when we're open again, please come visit us. We're in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and until we are open, you can learn more about the history of military medicine or more about our activities from our website or our Facebook page or our Twitter or our Instagram. Um, and now I will be open for questions, I guess. Before we do questions, I will just say, I am not an expert on the Civil War, so I might not know the answers, but I will try. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, would you mind uh, clicking stop sharing so we can see everyone? Awesome. Okay. So there are, are, are about 49 of us. So I have my screen open if you wanna raise your hand or if um, you wanna, okay, I see um, C. Lorish. Uh, Kristen, what was the uh, interest in or commitment to uh, dealing with psychological trauma during that period, if any? Um, it was definitely a developing field um, some of the specialty hospitals like Turner's Lane um, in Philadelphia were committed to, to looking at some of the psychological trauma. Um, they, they definitely were aware um, that soldiers were, um, had, had trauma from the war. Um, I don't know that they, um, it wasn't, tracked as well as it is today. So we don't have statistics on it um, the way we probably would today. Um, but there was a growing awareness and a, a growing um, body of research into the effects of, um, of war on the psyche. Was, was there any, it seemed as if the commitment to post 
for rehab, that is creating uh, uh, devices for limbs that were taken off, was focused on Union soldiers. What about the Confederate soldiers? The Confederates had their own programs um, to help their, their soldiers. So many of the states um, did have their own programs um, that, that were specifically designed to assist with Confederate soldiers. Um, they were not eligible for government assistance, so it really did uh, oh. fall on the states to provide that assistance to their soldiers. Thank you. Great question. Questions. All right. Uh, bear with me as I flip from screen to screen. I see John. John, you want to unmute yourself? There we go. Hi. In the picture of the Lincoln Hospital, and this is going to sound silly, but it, it piqued my interest when I saw it. You're looking down this long, you know, hallway with uh, all these beds. Mm -hmm. Above the beds. Uh, are these little paddle-like things that seem to be attached to seem to be attached to some kind of a running hole going uh, front and back in that room? And I'm thinking that since those those fan-like things are over the beds, that they must be some kind of fan for for circulating air or for fanning the person in the bed. Um, it, it just piqued my interest when I saw that, uh, since ventilation was. Uh, uh, recommended that they built the hospital um, with a to provide ample airflow and perhaps that was a means of ensuring that that airflow was flowing in other yes words, in other words a primitive HVAC yeah you're absolutely right um, the the full caption for that photo which I, I didn't include because I ran out of room but the full caption says something about um, fanning a fanning system um, so it was part of that uh, ventilation system and keeping air flowing. Um, so great picking up that detail. Cool, cool stuff. Thank you. Anyone else? If, if you don't have your audio showing, just go ahead and unmute yourself and chime right in because I certainly can't tell if you're raising your hand, but uh, just just a uh, crazy uh, thought. That is, with the mortality of disease at the time, you wonder if the Civil War would have turned out any differently if they would have had um, their encampments and moved around and played with wooden sticks, just let the diseases kill off people. I mean, there, there was a lot that they could have done to, um, to cut down on the disease situation. Um, there was a sanitary commission at the time that had recommendations on how to um, combat disease in the camps, but um, a lot of the, the sort of regimental, um, you know, smaller leadership units um, ignored that advice. Um, and, and so, changes that could have been made earlier to, um, you know, to address the disease was, were, those changes were not made. Um, and it actually wasn't until World War II um, that, that more soldiers died from combat than disease. Um, up, up through World War I, we were still losing more soldiers to disease and infection than, um, than actual combat. So penicillin really changed a lot. I have another comment about the hospital. Um, I noticed too, the bedspreads were all different. So I'm assuming that the community had a big part to play as well in this. And I'm also assuming that the community had a big part in the field hospitals too. You wanna to address that a little bit? Yeah, I don't know um, a lot about that. Um, I do know that the community, um, women from the community would often volunteer uh, to help um, you know, assist nurses in, in the field if there was um, uh, work happening, you know, battle happening in the area. Um, I don't know, um, I don't know that much about supplies being donated if, 
families were, you know, donating family blankets or knitting family blankets or, or what, um, that'd be a really interesting question to look into how, how they were getting those supplies and what sort of community involvement there was. Particularly as we think about, you know, now in this time of COVID, the amount of community pitching in that everyone's trying to do with masks could be interesting to make that parallel. Yeah, because if you look at that hospital shot, you know, looking down, each bedspread is different. You know, so that, that just kind of tells me that, yeah, the community jumped in. <laughs> yeah. Kristen, I, I may have uh, missed it. Has your work continued uh, cataloging uh, data and information on World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, Iraq War, and so on? Yes, um, the museum is still actively um, documenting the, the advances in the history of military medicine. Um, we did not collect medical specimens um, sort of past World War I, um, but, um, but we still collect artifacts and documents and oral histories and um, you know, videos and photographs. Uh, so it is still an active collections program um, that that is very interested in um, in always keeping on top of what's happening. Uh, I just want to read a comment from James Patterson to everyone. He said, great presentation. I was lucky to have served at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology from 1979 to 1980. And at the time, I believe this museum was on its grounds. I used to visit it during my lunch break. It is an outstanding museum. Thank you for this excellent talk. Just want to yes. intersperse that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yes, the, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology uh, was unfortunately closed down in 2010, um, but we were part of that institution for, um, for about 50 years. Um, and now we're a standalone uh, museum with the Department of Defense, Defense Health Agency. All right, anyone else? I'm looking for hands waving or comments or questions. I was really struck by the amazing mobilization of hospital beds. I don't remember the exact statistics, but it went from essentially no hospital beds to what, 400,000 beds in a, in a period of, what was it, 12 months, 18 months? Or I mean, that's just astounding that at that, that point in our history, that that kind of mobilization could happen, you know, so fast. Uh, you know, I, I hate the word unprecedented because that seems to be used uh, for every single thing uh, in the news these days. But my gosh, to, looking at something unprecedented, that is absolutely it. Yeah, they really tackled that situation. Um, so I think the number was 450,000 beds by the end of the war. So that was over a, a three year period. Um, but still, they, um, they, those hospitals went up very quickly. Um, and, and really, you know, they tried to, to make them as available as possible to get as many soldiers um, treated uh, efficiently and, and safely. When you said they tackled that, who was they? Was this the, the military? US Medical Department, yeah. So the U.S. Medical Department um, that, that would have been hiring whoever builds hospitals in, in the 1860s. Well, they knocked them together pretty fast. That's, um, that's remarkable. And when you, you know, I, 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 I tend to make a comparison between then and now with their abilities for industrial production and building and then the, the, the lack of some things we've seen during the course of the uh, coronavirus uh, episode here. Not enough test kits, not enough ventilators. I'm sure ventilators are complicated things to put together, but uh, uh, it's, it's remarkable for the time how, how they did what they did. Um, many times it was just manpower. Um, but uh, that's, that's fascinating. I'd like to know what the beds were, I know this is gonna sound silly, I'd like to know what the beds were actually made of. I'm assuming they were made out of um, 
uh, iron? I actually don't know. Um, yeah, that would, that would have to be something I would need to research a little bit. Um, I know a lot of the hospitals were were wood. They weren't exactly building like giant brick hospitals um, a lot of the times. But I, I don't know about the the bedding materials. Um, if they were iron frames or, or quick wood frames or what, we need to look into that. Well, Pat, my spouse is in the background and she said she has read that it was wood and straw the beds were made from. All right, we got an answer. All right, <laughs> Chris, you're off the hook. <laughs> Looking around, anyone else? Well, I just personally am, just have to say, I'm always struck by, you know, the, the disease factor. I just, it's quite shocking when you think about it. It's not something I learned in school when we talked about the North and the South fighting. There was no mention of that when I was growing up. So um, I think that's important information for people to have. Yeah. All right. Well, anyone else? I see thumbs up from your mother. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and a couple more folks saying, you know, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, excellent presentation. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. Thank you very well, thank much. Thank you so much for having me. You've been a really great audience today. Very engaged, good questions. So thank any, you. Any discussion of when the museum might reopen for visitors? Uh, we really don't know. Uh, we don't even know when we'll go back to work behind the scenes. Um, so we, we don't know when it will be safe for visitors. But, um, but we're developing plans and following state guidelines. And um, you know, hopefully so, we'll all be together soon. Which guidelines are you following, is the museum following? Uh, so the museum's in Maryland. Um, so we are following both the Maryland state guidelines um, and then we, our property is also controlled by Fort Detrick. Um, so um, army, um, army guidelines also. Stay safe. Yes, thank you, you too.